Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, this meeting is being live streamed on YouTube. And Sophia, you can go ahead. Hey, thank you, Kevin. And uh, welcome, everyone. I can see that everyone is slowly trickling in. So just want to say good morning. Um, we'll give folks a few minutes. Uh, to continue to trickle in. So we'll go ahead and start the presentation at about uh, 10.32. So uh, just a few more minutes and then we'll get started. So thanks and, and welcome again. Once again, welcome everyone and, and thank you for uh, joining us. We've got, uh, we're gonna give everyone just uh, another minute or so um, for folks to come in. Uh, just as a quick reminder, um, as we're doing the presentation uh, today, um, the Q&A is available. So uh, definitely feel free um, if you have any questions during the presentation to go ahead and pop it in there in that Q&A section um, of this webinar. I know um, last week when we did um, the, this presentation, I think there was uh, some, some shy uh, folks in the, in the audience that waited until the end, and then there, there was a huge flurry of questions and, um, at, you know, right before we closed out. So definitely feel free to um, put in your questions uh, uh, while you're listening to Kim, who will be presenting today. Um, and uh, we will tag some of them to answer live at the end of the presentation. So, um, you know, do, um, it's perfectly fine if you put in a question, you, you don't get an answer right away. Um, I think with that, um, it's about, uh, it's 1035, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I want to welcome everyone and thank you all again for attending our um, Neighborhood Opportunity Fund information session this morning. Um, we are really excited um, to say that our application is now open. It opened yesterday and we have over $4 million that are available to be awarded in this round. Um, many of you know that this is a competitive program. So part of the presentation will, today will really be to talk about um, how you should plan your projects and prepare your application that, so that it can be um, as competitive and, and rise to the top of um, the, uh, the submissions that we receive in this round. Um, but first off, um, I want to go ahead and just introduce the team that is with us here today. Um, I'm going to start with our colleagues at Summer Corps. Summer Corps is a nonprofit financial institution, um, and they have been contracted by DPD and the city of Chicago to help manage this program. 
So at Summer Corps, um, I first want to introduce Ruben Wadi. Ruben is the program director and has been with NOF program for many years. Um, Ruben, if you want to go ahead and say hello to everyone. Thank you, Sophia. Hi, everybody. Uh, like Sophia said, sorry. Uh, my name is Ruben Wadi, uh, and I'm the program director at Summer Corps, um, helping out with the administrative services for the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund. I appreciate you all being here, and I look forward uh, to all of you submitting applications for the program. Thank you. Thanks, Ruben. Um, and with Ruben, I also want to introduce the newest member of our team from Summer Corps, Marissa. Marissa, um, some of you may be um, familiar from her previous role at the Little Village uh, Chamber of Commerce. So we're super excited to have her come to this side of the um, part of the NOF program to really uh, continue to build on her um, ability to coach and work with applicants to get those projects um, completed and, and uh, you know, cross the finish line. So Marissa, if you wanna say hello to everyone. Hey, Sophia, good morning, everyone. And yes, I'm Marissa, I'm here with Summer Corps and I'm so excited to be part of this team and to work with all of you. So best wishes to everyone. Like Sophia said, let's make those applications very strong. And I also speak Spanish, so language is not a barrier. We're here to assist and help. Thank you. Awesome. Um, and then finally, to round out the team on Summer Corps side, we've got Kim Brisky. Uh, Kim is the Managing Director of Communications, and she is wonderful. She is a fountain of knowledge, um, not just about the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund program, but also the other uh, programs and products that Summer Corps provides um, or manages, such as the Small Business Improvement Fund and, and SBA loans. So Kim is going to be our... Um, our presenter this morning. So I'll let her introduce herself right before she gets started. Um, on the city side, um, I just wanted to introduce um, myself. My name is Sophia Carey and um, I, along with my colleague, Mary Kuhn, um, help uh, monitor the projects as they go through the, um, the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund program. Uh, Mary, if you wanna go ahead and say hello to everyone. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here and spending time with us. Uh, we are excited for this round and hope this presentation is helpful and that we can answer all your questions. Thanks, Mary. Um, so in addition to um, working with our uh, colleagues at Summer Corps to help all of these projects get across the finish line, um, I just want to highlight that Mary also um, oversees the technical assistance side of the program, of the NOF program. You'll hear a little bit more about that during the presentation today. Um, and then I work with other city departments to provide assistance to uh, grantees during the permitting phase, inspections, licensing, anything that you would need um, going through a city process. So um, with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn these over to Kim. Um, just one final reminder that you can go ahead and pop your questions in the Q&A section of your screen. So it should either be at the top or at the bottom. Um, just go ahead and type it in and we will reserve some of the questions for a live Q&A at the end. Um, so, uh, so it's perfectly fine to um, put in your questions now and then that way we can have them ready when Kim is done with the presentation. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and uh, turn things over to Kim. Kim, you wanna get us started? Absolutely. Thanks, Sophia. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Again, my name is Kim Brisky and I'm the Director of Communications here at Summer Corps. My background is in public policy and advocacy uh, and I really, Take it seriously being able to be an advocate for small businesses, so I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, as Sophia said, please use the Q&A box. Um, and the other reminder is that this presentation, both the video and the slides, will be available on the NOF website. So today there's going to be a lot of information, and I encourage you to take this as an opportunity to decide if this project, uh, if your project is a good fit for NOF, get inspired about the opportunities that you have. And, and start looking ahead and being able to prepare for the application process. All right, I'm gonna have my picture go away and then we will get started. So today, let's uh, kick it off. This is sort of a guidepost of what we're gonna be talking about. We're gonna be talking about the requirements, the application process, and then what to expect. 
before we get started, really, we need to just understand what the mission of the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund is. It's both for financial grants and technical assistance, up to $250,000 per project. And the focus is supporting you know, transformational investment in the city's south, southwest, and west sides. And the uh, important thing to remember is that these grant funds are actually uh, coming from a tax that is put on new loop uh, developments. And then those are being reinvested into these neighborhoods. The goals of this program are supporting entrepreneurs, attracting new businesses and cultural amenities, as well as providing sort of that baseline to create ongoing economic development and growth. This presentation is only going to focus on the small grants track. That's gonna be the grants up to $250,000. There is a large grant track, it's not covered today, but there is more information on the NOF website if you are interested. So as a reminder, the most you can receive for your grant is $250,000. This comp competitive program allows for these different types of projects. We're gonna do expansion and renovation for existing businesses, a new location for either a startup or an existing business, as well as new construction at vacant properties. So we know what kind of projects are eligible. Let's talk about which applicants would be eligible. There are uh, three different types of uh, business owners and uh, applicants that would be eligible. First are if you are the actual community property owner or the landlord. Uh, and so you actually want to be able to improve your space uh, with a known business use. Another option is if you're not necessarily the landlord, but you're actually the tenant in a space, you can also apply with landlord approval. Another option is if you are a nonprofit organization that provides a revenue generating commercial activity to the public. So to be clear though, uh, there are some folks that will not be eligible to apply. First, there'll be any residential properties, home-based business, live workspaces. Any residential space, we will not be able to use NOF grant funds. Another is manufacturing industrial businesses or properties will not be eligible. If you are interested for manufacturing and industrial business purposes, uh, we, but definitely I encourage you to check out the Summer Corps website because SPIF or the Small Business Improvement Fund does allow funds to be used for those types of businesses. Another type of ineligible applicant would be anybody looking to do social service organizations, workforce development, or daycare centers. And lastly, churches and places of worship will not be eligible. Uh, and just a quick little sidebar, this picture here is from the groundbreaking earlier this year for Sister, Sisters in Cinema, a media arts center that will be opening up at South Shore later this year. So we know what kind of projects are eligible, what kind of applicants. Let's talk about what you can actually use the grant funds for if you receive them. I, I generally say that if you can uh, put something on a dolly and wheel it out of your business, that's not going to be an eligible expense. We're talking about permanent building improvements. So eligible things would be major exterior and interior renovations and rebuilds to an existing building. We're talking about build outs, new build outs for incoming businesses. Building acquisition and site preparation can also be eligible. The one, uh, one thing to be noticing here is that you can only use money for building acquisition if you it's actually part of a larger project that you're actually going to be improving you know this is not for somebody who's interested in flipping properties this would be you know acquisition the space to be able to improve for the business other things that you could use funds for are fees for architectures and engineering which we'll get through in a little bit roofing, masonry, facade, windows, doors, all these external important exterior improvements, as well as the guts of your building, the mechanical systems, HVAC, electrical, plumbing, things like that, and security. Things that are not gonna be eligible for NOF funds. That's gonna be minor repairs or improvements when they're not uh, incidental as part of a larger project. So if you're saying that, oh man, my floors or my paint is looking rough and I'd really like to be able to improve that, that's not gonna be eligible. Once again, just wanna re-emphasize that we cannot use NOF funds for residential properties. 
If in the case of a mixed use building where you have commercial on one floor and residential on the other, there can be opportunities to use some of the NOF funds, let's say like for a roof or the exterior that covers both, but you can't do the rebuild interior of a residential space. We would also important to note to repairs to address building code violations are not eligible. And again, business operating expenses, not eligible. This grant is not for working capital. This is for the permanent building improvements. So we know what type of projects are eligible, what you can use the money for, the types of applicants that are eligible. Let's talk about the locations. As we mentioned at the top, this grant program really stands out because the funds are actually from loop improvements and then uh, specifically invested into targeted areas on the city's uh, south, southwest, and west sides. Right here, you can see a map of all the areas that are eligible for the, uh, for the NOF small program, eligible commercial corridors, priority investment corridors, and invest southwest corridors. To verify whether or not your project is on one of those corridors, you can visit chicago.gov slash NOF to confirm. And we will go uh, more in depth on that process shortly. So I'm gonna take a pause here and really dig into the grant calculation side of things because this I think is, is where we get a lot of questions. Again, the NOF grant is competitive. And it's also the way that you actually receive the funds can happen in two different ways. One, reimbursable, meaning you as the grantee expend the dollars and then request the funds back. Alternatively, you have an escrow option where there actually is you work with the city of Chicago to actually have a place that does the payments for you and actually uh, manages that and you can do them in targeted draws. But either way, you will have to have skin in the game. The total project cost, let's say as an example, we've got here, got 100% of total project costs that are eligible. No matter what type of project you have, new construction, existing construction, new business, renovation, we're talking about a base grant of 50% of eligible project costs you will receive no matter what. But Mayor Lightfoot actually recently made changes to the program that now allows grantees to receive up to 100% of eligible pro project costs back for their project. And here's how. There's two building community wealth bonus options for applicants. The first is you can receive an additional 25% of eligible product project costs in your grant if you are a local resident. And the definition of a local resident is if you are in the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund Qualified Investment Area. And I'll show that map uh, shortly, but that's gonna be uh, the same sort of criteria that they use to decide where the Invest Southwest corridors are and where the NOF grant corridors are. It's gonna be on your south, southwest and west sides. And that can actually be applied as you actually are doing the project. So you can know you'll have 75% of the eligible project costs covered and you'll know that from the start. An additional way you can actually get some of your grant covered, another 25% is with local hiring. Now this local hiring bonus though, it's important to note, you can only receive that after the project is complete and you're able to show proof of local hiring. This means that no matter what your uh, total uh, reimbursement cost will be at the end of your grant, even if it's 100%, you will have to contribute a minimum of 25% while completing the project. So this means even if your grant is 100% reimbursable and you receive all of these bonuses, you need to be prepared with financing for at least 25%. So and Ruben is gonna dig a little bit more into this and we can answer more questions, but I just think it's important to note that uh, regardless of what your project financing looks like, you will have to have some money prepared to expend on the project. All right, let's move on from this page now and talk about the technical assistance that can be provided both to applicants and as well to grantees to help get projects across the finish line. 
because the NOF, it's really about not just getting money out the door, but making sure that the projects are successful and impactful in these communities. And the best way to do that is to give you access to experts in the field. And we're talking about architects, construction managers, and financial consultants. And the great thing about the NOF program is that up to 95% of the cost of hiring these TAs can be included in your grant award. And we actually have an approved list of experts in these fields on the website that you can be in touch with. The amazing thing about these experts is they are at the top of their field. You know, we have the architect who helped complete the Whitney Young Library here in the city of Chicago and other massive projects, but they have a passion for helping the city of Chicago and these neighborhoods. So they are ready to help and experienced and knows what it takes to have a successful project. So after all of that, if this feels like it's a good fit for you, let's talk about the actual application process and how you complete the application. As Sophia said at the beginning, we are now open and accepting applications and we have $4 million that we are able now to invest in these projects. That's uh, the first place you need to go is chicago.gov slash NOF. And this is sort of what I was talking about earlier when I was mentioning uh, qualified investment areas and making sure that your project is eligible. This map here with the yellow, the, that is where you need to be living or your employees need to be living to be eligible for those extra grant bonuses. So to determine whether or not your property qualifies for an NOF small grant, you actually just click the search your address here and then you input it into this map right by these two red arrows. So now we're able to determine, indeed, your project is in an eligible location. The next check is going to make sure you are in an allowable industry. As we mentioned a few pages ago, manufacturing, social services, uh, place of worship, or residential, these projects are not eligible. So it's going to double check that that's not what you're applying for. And then it's just going to ask you what kind of business are you looking to operate? And this is just additional information for us to know what your eligibility is going to be and just to give us a picture of what type of applicants we have incoming. The next step is if it's determined you're eligible by your location and industry, you will automatically be directed to complete a project readiness quiz. This quiz is pretty easy. It's just seven multiple choice questions. You don't need any materials or additional information uh, beforehand. The key here for us is to be able to determine if sufficient planning has been completed and to also sort of for those who maybe aren't ready yet to apply, that we can get them to the right resources to get them there. Uh, I would say that, that for us, you know, we do spend a lot of time making sure projects are both shovel ready, I think that's the term that we use, that they're ready to be, get, get started quickly and that they're gonna have the maximum impact. So as we say here with the thumbs up, applicants who demonstrate a readiness to get started and provided with a unique application code and you are ready to go. So all you need to do then with that code is submit your application through submittable.com. And there are some steps to the application and it's possible you may not have everything right at your fingertips and that's just fine. You actually can save and come back. You'll be, you uh, will have an opportunity to upload all of these supplemental information to make sure your project and the reviewers have a full picture of what you're trying to achieve. We really encourage you to double and triple check before you click the final submit button to make sure your application is accurate and complete. And I would say this is the serious part is that again, as this is a competitive grant and not everybody who applies will receive funding. We are sticklers about making sure the applications are complete and on time. Anything that is either missing pieces or comes in after the application deadline will not be considered. So I wanna kind of give you some tips here because it's a competitive grant to help put you in the best position possible to be selected. And there are three different components that reviewers really look at when they're reviewing the program. The first is project readiness. Are you prepared and able to demonstrate how much you've actually already put into this project in terms of your planning and, and, and really uh, 
to be able to show that you can start as soon as you are approved and have access to the funding. The guiding principles are really being able to show that you have project readiness is one through site control. Does the applicant have site control? Site control means if you are the tenant, do you have a lease? If you are the building owner, the deed. But let's say, for example, you are in the process of leasing a space or you're in the process of purchasing the space at the time of application. As long as you can show us that you are close, that you have conversations with the landlord, conversations with uh, the building owner, uh, to be able to show that this is what you're going to be able to do, we can still accept your application, but know that until you actually formally have site control, you won't be able to move forward. Plan for construction. Does the applicant have a knowledgeable plan for when the project will begin and end? This is one of those times where it's you being able to put pen to paper to say what you actually want to do work-wise and how long you think it will take. Also, a budget with itemized costs, being able to decide in terms of uh, hard and soft costs, and if you've already worked with some professionals to give you uh, a starting place to be able to know what the final budget's going to be. And then also your uh, funding capacity. Have you already secured additional funds? But if not, can you actually show the capacity or show that you've already started communicating with lenders and bankers to, to work that project forward? The next tip is really, is really important, community engagement. Successful applications need to show knowledge of the neighborhood's unique needs and priorities and respond to their interests. I think when we talk about community engagement, it's really at the core of the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund. This, this is not the business opportunity fund, this is the neighborhood opportunity fund. This means these grant funds are not simply being used to make one business, uh, but also to impact the entire uh, neighborhood. And this means you have to really be a good fit for what's already existing. Have you already uh, been in communication publicly with the community, published your plans and know the goals of the neighborhood? Have you actually already engaged with community uh, leaders or, or previously? Are you new to the neighborhood or do you, do you have sort of a footprint already there? And, and do you know lo local community organizations and the locals there? Is this something they want and need? And you know, it's important to know what's already there. Does this make sense with what fits? Is this going to be uh, you know, the fourth taco shop on, on this strip or is this going to be something that people are really clamoring for and will really make a difference? This is important. And also just knowing what's the overall impact of this project on the corridor. The third, uh, which I think similarly goes along with knowing the impact on your entire community here is the design impact. Um, it really makes a statement as a community that you're serving and, and can really be sort of sometimes the start of a change, a spark of a change on a neighborhood, on a block to really, to really make everything uh, increase in value and bring more people in. The guiding principles of design are gonna be, is it equitable and inclusive? Is it innovative? Are you able to solve problems through your design? And does it match the vibe of the community? And, and also, are, are you being able to be safe? You know, you're not uh, you know, eating into the public way. All these types of things are really important to decide design impact. So I know that's a lot of information and things that we are looking for from our applicants, but I know you can do it. And you know, the NOF is entrusting you to essentially be a community partner and invest these funds in a way that can grow these neighborhoods. But we want you to be successful and we're gonna do everything we can to make that happen. And that includes providing ample resources for our NOF applicants. And the first start here is if you go to the NOF website, we've got the link right here, but you can also find it on the top of the NOF. Uh, uh, Chicago, uh, excuse me, chicago.gov slash NOF website. You can actually see it just says applicant support. And the first thing that we're gonna provide you with are actual organizations that are already prepared and trained and ready to help you with your application process. My guess is you probably recognize a lot of these logos on here. And if you give them a buzz to walk you through the application process, they'd be more than happy to help. And you can also see the complete list on the website as well as their location. So you can pick the one that's closest to you, but don't feel that you have to. You can pick the one that you think will best represent your needs. So let's talk about the next steps for the application period. 
as we mentioned before, the applications opened on Monday and they will close September 24th. The grants will be announced in January. And as we mentioned, it's really important right now that to actually get started on those projects. Make sure you're working with community partners to have a competitive application. Make sure that you can answer the quiz and achieve the uh, uh, project readiness designation to be able to start. And the most important thing, of course, when your application is submitted, it must be complete, online, and on time. Otherwise, it will not be accepted. So this here is a pretty awesome picture. This actually is from the most recent finalist presentation for the first round of NOF for this year. And so it's to give you a sort of a sense of what happens after you click send. After the application deadline, all the applications are reviewed and prioritized based on the two things we keep talking about here, which is your readiness as well as your strength or the impact that the project will have on the community. The amount of projects that are gonna be selected to go forward as finalists uh, are, is gonna be based on the money available. Once you are selected as an NOF finalist, we continue to have really outstanding resources available. We talked a lot already about the technical assistance side, which is gonna be your coaches, architects, construction managers, things like that. A really unique part about the NOF program is that we also uh, provide concierge service, meaning that city staff will are ready to help and support answer questions about building permits, construction timelines, inspections, licensing, things like that, that can be really tricky to navigate and to have somebody in the city uh, ready to help is a really great advantage. Additionally, business marketing. We are constantly talking about these success stories for NOF, and it's such an awesome celebration. Uh, we love to have ribbon cuttings at the end. The mayor typically does attend. We do social media stories, promotion. A lot of our projects also end up in the press. If you look at Block Club Chicago, uh, we've seen tons of our projects actually get emphasized. And, you know, on the serious side, though, you know, we do have to put sort of some guardrails on the project timing. Finalists are expected to complete their projects within two years. Loss of site control or project delays will lead to the revocation of grant awards. Obviously, uh, in, in the light of COVID-19, we all recognize that things do happen. But if you are noticing that you're having issues, delays with your project, the first thing you should do is give us a call. Let us know what's going on because maybe we can help you get over that delay, but that is a much better space to be in than suddenly we say, hey, we're, what's been going on? We haven't made any progress. Uh, you could run into um, you know, these deadlines pretty quickly. So now with the serious stuff out of the way, I just wanted to kind of highlight some really cool NOF projects that are already completed. This is Sean Michelle's homemade ice cream in Bronzeville. And I can personally attest that the cookies and cream is outstanding. Uh, it's really cool because this was just a blank canvas here. And now it's this awesome community meeting space and it's really delicious. Another uh, really interesting project was Osito's Tap here in Little Village. You see, again, this is just a total vacant space. Actually, this was, it's attached to an established family liquor store and they turned this blank space into a speakeasy. And this one really, to me, is really uh, interesting because you can just tell the high quality of the finishes. It really looks, uh, it really looks amazing, what a transformation. Another really cool project we want to highlight is AGB Investigative Services in Chicago Lawn. I picked this one specifically because of the exterior transformation. We talked a lot about the impact of design on a community and the sur surrounding block. And you can see what a difference just one building being able to completely redo the facade, the windows, the doors. It really is far more inviting and clean professional look for the neighborhood. And then another project, the 345 Art Gallery in East Gallery Park. They actually took that vacant lot uh, space there and actually turned it in to uh, an additional gallery space that, uh, and they, they actually use this as sort of a community space. And, and it's really impressive and transformational for this neighborhood. 
As we kind of wrap up the presentation portion, I just want to first uh, remind you if you want to use the Q&A box to put your questions in there, but also that we want to be your resource. We are ready to help you throughout this process. This is all of our contact information here. And you know the big website, chicago.gov slash NOF. But you know, I would say that's where you're gonna find all the basics, how to apply, the applicant resources, the map to make sure your project is eligible, project rules, examples, all of those things located in one space. As a reminder, the application period is already open and it will close on September 24th. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Sophia to start leading through the Q&A process. Hey, thanks so much, Kim. And um, I uh, see that there are a lot of questions, so I'll try and um, read them out from, uh, from the top and then kind of punt them to different folks uh, on the NOF team. Um, I'm going to start with a question from Jessica. I think it's, it's a really great question, um, and it has to do with startups. So, um, uh, Ruben, uh, for a startup looking to demonstrate financial feasibility, what format do you think um, that is best uh, represented in? Is it a full business plan? Are there other um, uh, you know, options for demonstrating financial feasibility? Sure thing. Um, and I believe that my response, uh, the first part of it will be catered more towards startups, but really there are some elements in these that will really apply to every project. This is a fantastic question. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so for startups specifically, I always encourage that if you are applying for the NOF and you're not an established business just yet, or you were recently established within the last year, that you submit a business plan. Uh, that of course includes financial information, not just pertaining to the project, but profitability for your business within the next uh, two, three, five, or even 10 years. And you can even include a strategic plan in there if you'd like. Um, so yes, we would like for you to demonstrate financial feasibility in a business plan, uh, you know, uh, showing your business's viability. But for the project itself, uh, the type of financial feasibility that we're looking for uh, is basically verification uh, that you have enough financing uh, to, uh, to fund your portion of the project, whether that be 25% uh, or whether that be whatever percentage it is um, that, you're grand, that you're eligible for minus the total project cost or total project cost minus the grant amount. Uh, so for that, we'd like to see uh, things along the line of uh, bank statements uh, showing that you have some financing in the bank. Uh, for your project, this could be personal finances or business finances. Uh, if you're speaking with a lender about a bridge loan or construction loan or something like that, we would like to see either closing documents uh, or a letter of intent from the bank, uh, promissory notes or whatever um, whatever it is that you might have. Again, this, uh, this part really isn't specific to startups per se, but rather to everybody that's applying. Uh, and the type of finances that I'm referring to are finances to actually complete the project. So that's what we're, we're looking for. Again, we like to see bank statements with sensitive information redacted, uh, lender information or whatever, to, uh, whatever else you might have as proof of financial feasibility. But going back to the startup specifically, yes, please provide a business plan. Not only will we like to see uh, projects, financial feasibility, but also business feasibility as well. Thank you. Oh. Thanks, Ruben. Um, Mary, Marissa, I know, you know, we all review applications, so um, just wanted to see if, if there's anything else you guys wanted to add to that or reemphasize. <laughs> no, I think Ruben covered it. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, okay, um, there's a number of questions about the NOF large grant program. So I'm going to try and um, answer uh, those questions kind of in, in a lump. Um, Kim, I don't know if you can flip back to the previous slide. Um, on the bottom there, you're going to see an email that's FID underscore intake at cityofchicago.org. Um, our recommendation is that anyone who um, is interested in and or intending to submit an application for the large NOF uh, grant track start by sending a, an intro email to that address. There is a separate team that works on the NOF large grants program um, and they monitor that email address and answer questions. And it's a really good idea to 
just introduce yourself and your team to them um, and give them a, kind of a heads up of the type of project that you're um, looking at and that, that they should be expecting your application. Uh, they are accepting applications right now. And our understanding is that they too will close their application on September 24th. Um, in terms of uh, the, um, the question about developers and additional forms, they have a completely separate application process from the NOF small grants um, track. So yes, there are two documents that are available on the NOF website that are specific to the large grants track. One is their uh, uni universal financial incentives application. Um, and then the other one is, they call it a developer form, but um, just to be clear, you know, we in the small grants track see a commercial property owner or a tenant who is planning to do construction to bring in um, a new business or to upgrade the um, space for an existing business also as developers. So a developer is really just a fancy way of saying someone that is going to own a project to develop or invest in real estate. So don't let that term be too, um, uh, too intimidating. Um, anyone can be a developer, whether that is a, a business tenant or um, a property owner on both the large and the small side. Um, the information that they are asking for is a little bit more specific because they do have to go through city council. Um, so their process timeline is a little bit longer. There's a different review criteria. Um, and then they also have requirements regarding um, WBE um, uh, construction requirements, prevailing wage requirements. So that is all on the large grant side. It's not something that we necessarily um, have to worry about, although we definitely encourage the use of women-owned, minority-owned businesses and trying to maintain as much of the um, employment, whether it's the construction side or the actual business employment locally. Um, we don't have that as a requirement. It's just strongly encouraged. So that is the reason why they do ask for a little bit more information. Um, again, for any other questions regarding the large grants track, um, the best thing to do is to shoot an email to that um, FID, which stands for Financial Incentives Division, FID underscore intake at cityofchicago.org. Okay, so moving on, um, there's a question about what is local hiring? Um, it, uh, is it a reference to contractors or actual employees? So, um, yeah, uh, Mary, you want to go ahead and take that that question? Sure. Um, so for local hiring, that is employees. Those are folks that are on your payroll that are not contractors. So contractors that are doing construction on your project, unfortunately, that does not count. This, These are employees that you hire after your project is completed uh, that are on your payroll um, that will count towards local hiring. Great. Thanks, Mary. Um, oh, and I see another question here about a large and small grants track. So um, going back to what I was saying earlier, you can really only apply for one or the other because it's based on your total project cost. Um, if, if you're coming in with a project that is, say, $5 million and you really only want to have no more than $250,000, we are more than happy to uh, review your application and um, assuming that you've got kind of enough funding to cover the remaining part of the project, um, definitely you're eligible for the NOF small grants track. However, if you need more than $250,000, um, the uh, the small grants track won't be able to uh, meet your kind of requirements. So you'll need to go into the large grants track. Um, at the end of the day, um, you choose one side or the other, you start with the application. Um, if for, for whatever reason you decide to um, go with the small grants track and then later on change your mind to go to the large grants track, what you end up doing is you end up withdrawing from the small grants track those funds are then reallocated to another small grants project. And then you start all over with a new application and, and working through the large um, grants uh, application process. So again, it is really important when you're going through the application to think about which track you're interested in and just apply uh, uh, through that kind of um, that program. Um, okay, here's another question about, will there be another uh, round of grant funding? And I'm so glad um, that this question was asked. So this round that we are open for right now is the second round of funding for this year. We do plan to have another two rounds of funding next year. Um, and that is, you know, for 
for as long as there's funds available. So we are planning to have um, two rounds every year. And so if you're looking at this program and you're really excited and you're realizing you're not going to have enough time to um, plan a project and submit a competitive application, it is okay to um, take some more time and really work on a strong project plan and apply uh, for the next round. Um, right now, we're looking at the first round of funding for next year as being open in February, March. So it, it will be, um, it'll, it'll be just a few months after we close on this one. So thank you for asking that question. Um, okay, so um, here's another question about um, working with specific architects and construction managers. Um, if we get awarded, do we have to work with a specific architect or a construction manager? Um, Marissa, you wanna go ahead and answer that one? Sure, thank you, Sophia. Um, you can choose, we do have on our website, a list of um, architects and TAs um, that you can choose from there. You, are, um, you decide who you would like to work with. And if there's somebody outside of, um, of the ones we recommend, um, yes, you can work with them. Thanks. Um, and then related to that, um, what is the difference between free concierge services and the TA service providers? Um, uh, I know that the TA service providers can be paid out through uh, the NOF grant. So kind of what, what is the difference between the two of those? Um, Mary, you wanna take a stab at answering that one? Um, sure, so um, for the TA services, we have architects, construction managers, and lending coaches available. Um, once you're accepted into the program, we cover 95% of those costs um, and you as the finalist or grantee would cover 5% of that cost upfront, um, and then we pay for the rest of it. Um, the concierge services, that's in-house here um, with our NOF team, um, where we assist with any issues it might encounter with the, you know, permits, other things like that. So they are different services. Um, your, your TA may be helping you as well. Um, it, it, takes a, it takes a village to do these projects. Thanks, Mary. Um, here's a question uh, regarding uh, credit scores. Um, how does one's credit um, affect uh, the competitive, competitiveness of their application? Uh, Ruben, you wanna go ahead and uh, try, try and answer that one? Sure, thank you. Um, so while there isn't a baseline credit score that you need to apply for and ultimately potentially become a finalist, uh, credit scores are looked at uh, by a lot of lenders, of course, uh, when they're trying to determine what sort of loan someone might, have, uh, someone might um, be able to get if they're able to get a loan at all. Um, and that's part of the financing uh, portion of the project readiness. Uh, credit score really is related to your ability to attain financing if you don't have financing readily available. Uh, so again, there isn't a baseline credit score for the NOF application uh, in and of itself, uh, but the higher the credit score, the more likely it is that you'll have access to a wider array of financing that might help you complete the project. Um, I will say this about the credit score. If you believe that your uh, business credit score or personal credit score are lower uh, than you'd imagine, but you're able to demonstrate uh, what, what steps you're taking in order to improve that credit score, uh, you can go ahead and send those along as well. I think that's just as viable as sending over, uh, you know, the credit score uh, in a vacuum. So yeah, be, feel free to demonstrate what it is that you're doing to improve your credit score if you believe that it's not at the level that you would like for it to be. Cool. Thanks, Ruben. And then along with that, <laughs> I'm not gonna let you <laughs> stop that quickly. Um, this is a great question about awarded applicants being announced in January. Will those awarded applicants need to have 25% 25, 25 of the funds at that time? Um, at the time of selection, you do not need to have 25% of funds. You do not need to have your contribution. Uh, throughout the process of being a finalist, uh, there are certain stages and, and certain milestones that you'll have to hit. One of those milestones, of course, will be giving, uh, uh, showing proof of financing. If you have proof of financing in advance of that milestone, if you were to be selected as a finalist, then by all means, send that. 
and by all means send it with your application because it just uh, demonstrates financial readiness. With that said, you, you don't have to have it at the time you apply and it isn't necessarily a, a requirement uh, to be selected as a finalist. But with that said, there's a reason that we are speaking about financial readiness. Uh, we, uh, the stronger applications are able to prove that they have finances readily available or a very, very, very clear path forward uh, for getting finances available. So it does behoove applicants to be able to demonstrate uh, that they have some sort of financial capacity earlier on, but it's not necessarily something that they absolutely need to have by the time that they become a finalist. That is the milestone that's hit uh, somewhere along the lines of becoming a finalist or going through the finalist stages. Thanks, Ruben. Um, okay, the next question, um, I'll uh, punt over to Mary. Um, what if an applicant applies and doesn't get selected? Um, can they apply in another round or what do you, what would you recommend that they do? Sure, that's a great question. So we do encourage folks to reapply um, and uh, work with those community partners or, or TAs if you like um, to strengthen the application. Um, we do have a question where we ask um, if you have applied in the past, it's, it's I'm not going to be counted against you if you weren't selected before. Um, but if you can demonstrate that something is, you know, improved, different, stronger, um, that's going to go a long way with the, the application this time. Great. Thanks, Mary. Um, so there's a question here that's asking how many grant recipients will be selected for this round. Um, uh, just wanted to be clear, we don't have a specific number of recipients that we're trying to hit. We're really looking at who, who uh, is submitting competitive kind of ready to go projects in their application. And we have just a little over $4 million. So what the way it works is every application that is submitted, fully submitted is reviewed um, and they are ranked in terms of the readiness, the feasibility and the impact that it will have on the neighborhood and the corridor. And then we basically work our way down until the funding is, um, is completely allocated. So there's not a specific number of grant recipients. In general, for about a $4 million, we're looking at you know, anywhere between 20 and, and 25 um, uh, recipients. But again, that's also very dependent on the dollar amount of the total projects that are, are um, being submitted in the application round. Um, Let's see, what else? Um, oh, this is a really good cross question about who is part of the review committee. Um, Marissa, you wanna go ahead and answer that one? Sure. So for the review, it's a process and it goes through several uh, people, uh, uh, groups. So some occur, we're one of them. Also, um, DPD is these others that review the applications and we also have some city colleagues that review this um, the committee as well so it's it's a process and it goes through what is it so if you made 25 people that review this or maybe more yeah it's about it's between rounds, 20 um, and 25 right yeah yeah so it's not just us here the team but uh, it's it's a it's a larger group that reviews these applications and there's a process to it so a lot of details Thank you. Um, a question that just came in asking about um, funding folks who are native to the funded corridors um, or folks who actually live and grew up in the area, is that accounted for at all? Um, the answer to that, um, I'll, I'll say is yes. Um, if you, you, no, no project is identical, but assuming that there are two identical projects with the same cost and, re, uh, and uh, feasibility, and we've only got funding for, for one of those projects, um, it will go to the, um, the applicant who demonstrates a, a clear knowledge and familiarity with the corridor. So if they live there, um, that will typically um, uh, give them a more competitive application. Let's see, what else? Um, there's some more questions about the scoring roster or, or rubric. So the way the our, and this is just for the small grant chart, the way our review work 
metrics is every application is reviewed. And the first thing we do is really look at eligibility. So we have to make sure that every address that is presented and every use that is presented, business uh, proposal is eligible. From there, there's um, probably, I'm trying to remember six or seven levels of cuts as we get closer and closer to the top. But, um, and we have different players as Marissa said. So there are planners, neighborhood planners um, within city hall that help review other city departments. So the buildings department, business licensing, department of finance, when it comes to um, say uh, debts associated with the building, you know, unpaid water bills, that sort of thing. So there's, there's a lot of folks that review. Um, we also have a great advisory committee um, who helps with the final selection as well. So those are again, community stakeholders from the, um, lending um, industry, from community developers, uh, design professionals, uh, even uh, local business owners. So um, we do uh, try and have the uh, review be as um, uh, inclusive of the different perspectives as possible. Um, let's see. Um, and then I think last question um, I'll answer here. There's a question about whether these information uh, sessions can be provided on a more regular basis, um, particularly for um, underserved areas of the city. So a couple of things just to speak to that. One is all of these information sessions, both the English and the Spanish ones are recorded and they are available on the DPD YouTube channel at any time. So for anyone who misses an information session, they can always go through um, the YouTube channel and review a previously uh, present, you know, a, a previous presentation. Our uh, presentation deck is also available. So the slides that Kim walked you through today, um, they are all available again, both in English and Spanish on the NOF website. Um, and I'll also say, you know, the community partners that we work with, um, this is what they're doing. And they're doing this um, you know, day in, day out, month after month, regardless of whether the NOF program is open to accept applications at a particular time or, or not. So um, they are really, um, uh, I, in my personal opinion, a, an unutilized, underutilized resource for folks that are interested in applying. Um, we will, we have done analysis of applications before um, in terms of who um, ends up being selected after, you know, the selections are made. And we see consistently that those applicants who work with a community partner who get the coaching to look at how do they, you know, present their financial feasibility? How do they present the impact that that project is going to have in the corridor? Um, those those are all things that community partners can coach um, uh, entrepreneurs on. So definitely working with a community partner is, uh, is, is incredibly helpful for an application. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, Mary, Ruben, uh, Marissa, Kim, and anything else you guys want to add to that? I, I saw some nods. Um, there's a question that just came in about the architects and engineering fees. Um, so we have the TA program. Uh, once you start in the program, um, if you've spent your own funds on that uh, prior to your NOF project uh, within six months of your application, we do have pre-development um, costs that we can help you out with up to 25,000. We cover 75% of those costs. So soft costs are something that we can help with. Um, if it was, you know, within a few months of your application. Um, and one more thing, did we cover uh, the construction? Um, construction can't start until you're approved in NOF. Did we already cover that? I don't know if you want to just restate that. Yeah, so no, yeah, that's, that's great. Point. Ruben, um, why don't you talk, talk to that? Because I know you've had some uh, personal experience uh, looking at projects like that. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, so one point that I'd like to emphasize um, is uh, this grant can only be attained, number one, after being selected as a finalist, and number two, not beginning the project until uh, a specific milestone has been hit, and therefore you're given the green light. Um, so essentially what this means for you is if the project is already complete and you're applying for a retroactive grant, um, that application is automatically not going to be selected as a finalist because the work has already been complete. 
Um, there's a series of checks and balances that goes into making sure that a project proceeded in the typical city of Chicago legal manner. Uh, this is one of the main reasons why we do not allow for work to begin until a specific milestone has been reached. So therefore, if a project was done and you're retroactively uh, applying for the grant, we can't go through those checks and balances. Uh, and therefore it will not be eligible for the grant. Um, if you are applying and you submit an application, but before you're selected, you perform the project again, that's not eligible uh, for the grant because you haven't been selected as a finalist and therefore we can't go through and verify the project. So if you're very serious about this grant um, and you can hold off on performing the project, uh, then, uh, then please do so. And please know that that is how you become a finalist. Uh, because if you have completed the project already, or if you complete the project during the application process before you're selected as a finalist, or even if you complete the project after being selected as a finalist and you didn't let us know that you were completing the project, um, then that means uh, that you will not be selected or in the case if you are selected, uh, but didn't tell us about the project and finish it, then you're forfeiting thousands of dollars. So it is a very serious thing. So please do not uh, finish your projects. Please do not start your projects, um, you know, before becoming a finalist and before hitting a certain milestone within the process uh, that will give you the de facto green light. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ruben. And I, I would say that that's not unusual, not just for NOF, but, you know, SPIF. If you think about it, I'm not aware of any grant program out there, local, state, or federal, that will retroactively give you funds for something that you've already done. So in general, grant programs are set up so that um, the work that the grant is funding is started after you receive the grant. So, um. I know we're, we're two minutes after, um, but I just wanted to open the floor up to um, everyone on the team. Any final thoughts, any final tips, hints, reminders? <laughs> I was gonna say too, uh, just I think we were talking a lot about resources that are available in addition to DPD, uh, BACP, which is the Department of um, Business Affairs, Consumer Protection, they also have like small business focused classes all the time, webinars. And they can be, I know before COVID they were at City Hall, but they also were sometimes on the road. Now I know they're webinars. And this is everything from like business planning, uh, you know, permitting, all these other things that actually are important elements to this project as well. And so if you're interested uh, in, uh, in getting that perspective as well, I, I really do encourage that. And those are all free as well. Yeah, free. <laughs> um, Sophia, just a tip for folks. Um, if, uh, if applicants can get a bid and include that in their um, application, that's gonna go a long, long way. A lot of people don't have bids in their applications, but the ones that do um, typically have a pretty strong application because the numbers in your budget are probably gonna make more sense in your project timelines are also gonna be stronger when you've been talking to contractors and you have a better sense of your project. So if you can include, include bids, uh, that's a, a really good thing for your application. Um, and also yeah. just wanted to remind everyone that the application is available in Spanish. So if you feel comfortable and would like to apply in Spanish, it is available. So. Um, and if you need assistance, we're here. We're here to help and support your project. And the more you know about your project, the, uh, the greater chances and opportunities you'll have for this grant. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, yeah. I see a, pop, uh, a question just popped in about um, what is a bid or, or what do we mean by bid? So a, a bid is just another way of saying um, like an estimate from a, from a contractor or a um uh, you know, for the work that's being done. And um, I'm going to echo what Mary said about how incredibly important it is that you have um, gotten a really good sense of how much um, the project is going to cost. Um, I, I will say one of the challenges that I always um, think is just so unnecessary, um, but happens more often than we'd like, are applicants who come in and I, you know, I, I don't know if they're just, you know, quoting it based on, you know, how much money they've got or, or how they come up with a number, but they'll say, oh, a project is going to cost no more than $40,000. Um, 
um, and they don't have anything to support where they got that $40,000 from, um, they get selected. Uh, and then when they go out to talk to a general contractor, all of a sudden, that $40,000 project is no longer $40,000, it's $400,000. Well, the way we, it, we calculate the grant awards is based on the number that you give us in your application. So as I, as I mentioned, you know, if we have $4 million and based on the application you submit, we've only allocated $20,000 to you because you told us it was for $40,000 project. And all of a sudden you come back and say, actually, it's not a, you know, $40,000 project. It's a $400,000 project and you need $200,000. Well, we won't have the funds to, uh, to meet that need. So um, it is really important that when you're looking at the project costs that you do it with your eyes open um, and that you don't underestimate it because it can affect how much funding is actually available for you once we're you know, finalizing your project scope and giving out that grant contract. And I, I did want to say, Sophia, from a, as a financial institution perspective, just to that end, at every stage of the game, the more uh, upfront and prepared that you can be like really helps. Like if you know that this could potentially be an issue, I just know that we're trying to partner with you to get these projects across the finish line. So it's way better if you're like, hey, I have this concern because we might be able to help you. So and whether it comes to like talking to a financial institution to try to get a loan um, to working with us, upfront is always better. Um, and we, that, that's the point of this program is to, to help get these projects across the finish line. So uh, I just wanted to really to emphasize that because we do run into that sometimes where people are afraid to talk about it. Let's be honest, financing is like super private. Your own business is like even that's like even your baby. You know what I mean? So I understand there's difficulties there, but I encourage everybody honesty upfront really helps. Yeah. Thanks, Kim. Um, OK, thank you, everyone. Um, I know we're uh, about seven minutes um, after. So good luck to everyone who um, applies and uh, definitely reach out if you have any questions and work with those community partners because they can really help you coach and work on those questions in the application. Take care. Look, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.